when people have faith in you, you want to deliver. It's so unusual when somebody actually is doing something good for you or, or believing in you or, you know, it's, it's extremely rare, you know. And when that happens, I want to like over deliver. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. Hope you are doing great today. I am. The sun is shining in my head, in my heart, and luckily outside as well. I've got an amazing guest for you today. His name is Stevie Van Zant. You know him best as the guitarist and founding member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band and or as Tony Soprano's consigliere Silvio on The Sopranos or as the star of the Netflix hit Lily Hammer. Uh, he's got a memoir that just came out, and I got the opportunity to talk to him about everything from the Beatles to hip-hop to disappointment and work ethic and Nelson Mandela and living your purpose. It was a fun, free-ranging conversation, and I am looking forward to sharing it with you in just a moment. But first, I want to say hello to the new members of the Crazy Money Listeners Group on Facebook. These uh, people from the past week would be Mike Murphy. Hello, Murph. Happy early birthday. Hope you're doing great. Miss you, buddy. Hello, Aaron Mick, MC. I assume that's short for Mick something. You're just being mysterious. Hello, Aaron Mick Mysterious. Or is that just like MC, like Louis C.K.? I don't know. Minaj Pillai. I think Pillai, Pillai. Hello to you, sir, in Perth of Western Australia. Thank you for listening to the podcast many time zones away. I'm happy you're getting some value from it. Mr. Paul Mutter, thank you for joining. Nice to see your face in my feed. I hope you and all your loved ones are doing great. Thank you also. We had a great show this past Saturday night out at the Brookstone Country Club. These country club shows are super fun. People are dying to get out, see their friends, have entertainment in a space where they feel comfortable. So if you belong to a club, what be it country, city, suburban, whatever, let's talk. Let's put together a comedy evening for you and your friends. Shoot me a note at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Or you could even send me a note if you just want to say hi. I accept hellos and greetings on the email. All right. Hey, I've said it before and I'll say it again. One of the coolest things about having a podcast is all the cool people I get to meet whom I otherwise would not have had the chance to do so, to meet so. Although, as I recall, I actually did get to interview Stephen Van Zant about 16 years ago after working at Yahoo and doing comedy out in LA. My friend Howie called and said, hey, would you want to be the co-host of a live stream we're doing with Howard Stern? He's leaving regular radio, terrestrial radio, and going to Sirius XM. I guess it was just Sirius at the time to take all his programs over there. And I was like, sure, man, I get a free trip to New York. You put me on the camera. I'll do that. And one of the people I got to interview there as part of the whole thing was Stevie Van Zandt. We just sat there and talked for like 10 minutes. It was super fun. I wish I could find the footage. Howie, if you have it, shoot it to me. So it was fun to talk to him then. And it's great to reconnect to him again today because I don't think my chances of hosting Yahoo live streams are going to come around that often anymore. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Stevie Van Zandt. He is best known, as I mentioned before, as one of the founding members of the E Street Band. Those are the musical partners of Mr. Bruce Springsteen. He's also very well known for playing Silvio Dante on HBO's The Sopranos and Frank Tagliano on Netflix's Lily Hammer. But as he shares in this new memoir that just came out, and it's called Unrequited Infatuation, Stevie's done an incredible amount of stuff with his career. And even though a lot of it didn't turn out quite as he had expected or hoped, he's just done an incredibly rich breadth and depth of stuff. As a producer, songwriter, and arranger, he's worked with some of the top musicians in the world from a variety of genres. His songs have been performed by Jackson Brown, Pearl Jam, Nancy Sinatra, and many, many more. He's a co-producer of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band's albums, both The River and Born in the USA. He's acted in the role of Jerry Vale and Martin Scorsese's Netflix epic, The Irishman. He programs and hosts two radio channels on Sirius XM, and somewhere along the way, he has found the time to fight for causes he believes in, most notably his work with Artists Against Apartheid, for which he was honored by the United Nations. When I say apartheid, I say it like that because that's how Bono said it in the song Silver and Gold on their live album Rattle and Hum when he said, a friend of ours, Little Steven, was putting together an album called Artists Against Apartheid. Anyway, I digress. In today's conversation, Stevie shares the frustrations and occasional disappointments of putting your whole heart and sometimes all your money into your artistic vision. 
We talk about the price of picking a path and the pros and cons of following your heart. And as you'll hear, Stevie's led with his heart. Bruce Springsteen calls Stevie the planet's most charismatic, dedicated, and visible crusader scrapping to preserve the dirty purity of rock and roll. And that seems pretty apt. It was a treat to speak to him. This, my friends, is Stevie Van Zant. Stevie Van Zant, welcome to Crazy Money. Good to be with you, Paul. You've just published a memoir called Unrequited Infatuations. Where does the title come from? Well, now, you know, you got to kind of read the book uh, <laughs> to know that because <laughs> it's not an easy it's not an easy answer. I tried to focus on the, on the more universal themes. You know, I, I didn't want it to be a book that's just about music for music people, you know. Obviously, it starts off that way, just like my life started off that way. It kind of goes to a whole other place and it becomes a little bit more about a search for identity and a search for purpose and, and those bigger kind of themes, you know, uh, search for enlightenment and chasing greatness. I think most people go through life a little bit disappointed and I'm one of them and a little frustrated. We're all trying to realize our potential. And uh, sometimes we are thwarted from doing so, sometimes by our own, you know, our own uh, <laughs> inner demons. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes the, the demons are within, sometimes the demons are without. It comes down to, um, you know, I've had some great successes in my life, and they mostly, mostly have all been with collaborations uh, with Bruce Springsteen or with David Chase or, or you know, uh, with uh, Norwegians and Lilyhammer and uh, <laughs> and some of the most important aspects of my own creativity really have never quite found an audience, you know, my solo records uh, in particular. So it kind of comes from that, you know, from uh, the things you love most, not loving you back <laughs> quite as much as, you know, you love it. I can identify with that at this point in my career. You can try as hard as you want, but there's no guarantee that you're going to be rewarded with the fame and adulation that you think you might deserve. And it's not really about so much the fame and adulation as much as just enough commercial success where you can keep doing it. That's the thing. On the other hand, the art really and the craft really is its own reward. That's not some kind of cliche. That really is true. So I'm, I'm not the least bit dissatisfied with my work, I'm, I must say. I, you know, going back and really examining it, you know, which I had to do for the book, you know, there's not much I would have changed, to tell you the truth. So I'm not, I'm not the least bit unhappy about the work. But in the end, it kind of becomes a, a story of <laughs> a triumph of art over commerce <laughs> rather than <laughs> art with commerce. <laughs> you know? Art despite commerce. And part of the challenge of interviewing you is, is the extraordinary breadth of all the things that you've done. And that might be one of the explanations for why some things never took traction, because you were always trying different things, right? Yeah, but not in a dilettante type of way. I no, mean, when, no, I, no. when I do something, I do, I do it 100%. You know what I mean? I don't move on until I feel quite satisfied that I've given 100% to whatever that particular thing is. You know what I mean? I'm not just flailing about, you know, looking for something that has some common ground. I tend to do what's interesting to me at the time. And I, you know, and I, and I give it hundred percent, you know, you hope that it finds an audience. Yeah. Yeah. You write that as a kid, you had a penchant for metaphysical zealotry, a need to be part of something larger. Was music one of those things? Well, yeah. I mean, specifically being in a band was one of those things, you know, for starters, you know, you want to be part of something. I think that's a really a natural human instinct. I think for the most part, you know, you want to be part of something greater than yourself to kind of support your thoughts, your sensibility, your, your ambitions, I guess. So you start off, you know, wanting to be in a band and then to hopefully be part of the music world, which against all odds, you know, we succeeded at with E Street Band. And then it goes from there. Then, you know, then, then once that was over, you're starting to really search for your purpose and your, uh, you know, rationalization for existence after that, you know? Yeah. You talk about the departure from the E Street Band. You said you wanted to discover who you were and how the world worked. It was then or never. Once you were on the road to being rich, there's no going back. The rich have too much to lose. And then you call yourself, oh, what a putt for thinking along those lines. Has the sense of idealism been something that you've struggled with trying to make a living as an artist the whole time? 
Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you know, every time those bills come in, you know, along the way, I just, I don't know how I did it really, but I've kind of accumulated this huge family uh, in my businesses, you know, so I have a lot of uh, responsibility to whatever it is, 50 people that work for me. And the only problem with the businesses is none of them make any money. So it's sort of a constant, you know, struggle to um, achieve my lifelong goal of breaking even. So every once in a while, of course, you know, you, you say, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if I didn't have to worry about this ridiculous overhead every month? You know, that's just uh, the way it went. It's not really a, against the idealism or instead of the idealism. It's just, you know, you wish you could have done both. You know what I mean? It comes down to, I wish I could have stayed in the E Street Band and done all of these things I've done since I left, you know? Mm-hmm. Truth of the matter is, it probably wouldn't have happened. But, you, you know, you fantasize about that. I mean, when you go back and look at it all, you say, well, geez, if only I could have stayed, you know, and done the solo albums and done Sopranos and Lily Hammer and gotten Mandel out of jail and, you know, and this and that and that, you know. But realistically, it probably wouldn't wouldn't have worked out that way. So it is what it is. You know? Do you mean you wouldn't have worked out with the E Street Band or you would have eventually blown yourself up for the desire to do all those other things? Because you have, you seem to have both in your head at the same time, this desire to be, as we talked about before, desire to be part of something bigger. And yet you want either a seat at the table or a clear channel through which to get all the art that's inside of you out and do it on your terms. I'm not sure what would have, uh, it's hard to predict what direction it would have gone though. I'm not sure it would have been any, anything having to do with solo albums. My artistry, I think, would have taken more uh, of the path of, of writing or producing. Because, you know, my inclination is not to be the front guy. You know, I don't, I don't have that inclination, that natural inclination to be the front guy. So I think it would have gone more in the direction of producing, you know, behind the scenes or, you know, writing. And, you know, and that's a really uh, important way to, of expressing one's artistic ambitions but I don't, I don't think i would have made solo records I, I don't think i would have gone that deeply inside myself because you're forced to when you're writing your own records all five of my 80s records are all very autobiographical and very uh very very personal in addition to being very political i mean i, I wouldn't really have had to write a book almost everything i know is in the born again savage album to be honest you know I finally remastered everything and re-released everything last in the last couple of years. The Rock and Roll Rebel package is all my masters from the 80s. You know, that Born Against Savage album contains almost everything I know and everything I think, you know. So, you know, I could have saved myself a lot of work if people had been, you know, knew about that album. Yeah, I'm not sure what direction it would have taken. I would have been doing something, probably like in more producing than, than writing my own records, you know. You say in the book that one of the things that differentiates you from a frontman is that frontmen need the spotlight, but you didn't need the spotlight. What did you need? Or what did you want? I needed the companionship, the friendship, the family, you know, vibe. I'm a band guy. I'm an ensemble guy. You know, the same thing with the Sopranos. Same thing with Lily Hammer. You know, whatever I do, I got to like everybody I'm doing it with. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I just don't, you know, I don't have any patience anymore for drama or, you know, superficial drama or some kind of personality conflicts or any of that stuff. I, I just, I don't have the patience for it anymore. So my need is to um, be part of a, you know, a group trying to accomplish something, whether it's a record or a, a radio show, TV show or a movie or a Broadway show, you know, whatever I'm engaged in, it's that group of crafts people that I uh, love working with. That's what I get off on. Yeah. Let's go back in time, how you felt playing records in your room as a kid. What were the first records that really lit you up inside? I collected singles, you know, early 60s mostly. Duke of Earl and, and um, Pretty Little Angel Eyes. And Tears on My Pillow was the first record I ever bought. Little Anthony and the Imperials. You Can't Sit Down and Bristol Stomp. The Dovells, who I would later actually tour with for a year. The Four Seasons were very big. Early Motown at that point would have been the Marvelettes and, you know, early Miracles. Palisades Park, very big, very big. Chuck Barris is the most famous moment in rock and roll. 
I didn't really have a, that much of a connection. I, I, and I know this sounds weird, but I, I never really had the connection to the artists exactly. You know what I mean? It was more to the records. And I don't know, I didn't have that big a desire to necessarily, you know, go see them. I, you know, I wasn't quite associating the artists with the records. I, I don't know why. Right. Until the British invasion, you know, until the Beatles came. And suddenly that was the first real band I'd ever seen with the Beatles. You know what I mean? You, you didn't see bands like that, that, that sang and played. If you went to your high school dance, it was an instrumental band. I wasn't really conscious of the artists themselves until, until the British invasion came. And then, you know, it was one after the other, just fantastic bands, Beatles, Dave Clark five and Herman's Hermits and, you know, the Rolling Stones and the who and the kinks and the animals and one after the other, uh, you know, Yardbirds. It became a, a real line in the history books between pre-British invasion and post-British invasion. You know, the British invasion began a whole new epoch, a whole new era of cultural history, you know, because it was about to give birth to a Renaissance period in the 60s. And I define Renaissance by when the greatest art being made is also the most commercial, you got yourself a Renaissance and that's what was happening. And that came from the birth of the British invasion combining with Bob Dylan, basically, and his consciousness, his lyric consciousness. That was a very odd combination, you know, what Bob was doing was bringing country blues and folk music storytelling and relevance, social and political relevance into the pop idiom, which was a extremely odd move that had never happened before in history, really. And suddenly, uh, and of course, everybody embraced that, you know, the Beatles and Stones and of course the birds and, and suddenly that combination of all those guys created this, this art form suddenly I clock it from 1965, but it wasn't really recognized until 1967 with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is an extraordinarily important album. But actually, the art form was actually happening a couple of years before that. How long do you think that lasted? Well, the rock era, I clock from 65, from Like a Rolling Stone, to Kurt Cobain's death in 94. It's exactly 30 years. We returned to a pop era at that point. And that's going to stay a pop era now forevermore, I think. I think the rock era was a blip on the radar screen. It was a complete anomaly. We just happened to be alive at that moment. And hundreds of years from now, it'll be looked at like a very strange moment in time, I think. A wonderful moment in time, but a very strange one where rock really dominated the culture. We've now returned to a cult which is where we were in the 50s, you know, and that's probably where we belong, to be honest. <laughs> it's all right. You saw hip hop come along. I mean, you were one of the catalysts to bringing it to the mainstream when, with the work you did with uh, Artists Against Apartheid. Is that a totally separate era? Is it a related era? What do you think? It became part of the rock era, really. You know, it was just another hybrid, a very valuable hybrid, I think, especially to the black community at, at first. Of course, it spread from there to everybody, but... You know, it came at a very, very critical time when um, black artists were just not expected to express themselves in a personal way or a political way. I'd watched the fight happen between Marvin Gaye and Barry Gordy, who was his uh, record company owner at Motown. And uh, Motown was extremely successful. I mean, uh, one of the greatest record companies, I would say the greatest record company ever. If you look at their roster, it's just ridiculous. But at a certain point, Marvin Gaye wanted to make a political record. His brother was in Vietnam and, and there's riots all over the place in the sixties and you know, all kinds of turmoil and civil rights and Vietnam, women's rights, you name it, environment. And Barry Gordy didn't want him to do it. Thought it, thought it would end his career and he fought him and, and he ended up winning. So that, that was an important moment with what's going on. The song called what's going on, the album, what's going on, which was, uh, I want to say 71, 72, somewhere in there. And then Stevie Wonder had the same kind of need for liberation. So he had his fight also with Barry Gordy, and he also won, and then made like five of his greatest albums in a row. <laughs> right. But still, I'm trying to think now, I mean, you know, then you got George Clinton coming along with Parliament Funkadelic, and, and of course, Sly and the Family Stone uh, before that. They really started it, Sly and the Family Stone really started it all, in a, in a way, uh, in, in the rock pop world you know 
but it was um, still unusual. It was still kind of, uh, you know, because uh, almost right away, just as this is happening in that early 70s period, you know, disco kind of started. And disco was, for the most part, kind of, you know, apolitical, you know, not, not particularly, uh, you know, more escapist entertainment, you know. So it wasn't that typical a thing with the black artist to be expressing themselves. And along comes early rap. And I was like, this is what I think this is what the black community has been waiting for and very much needing. So I put them on the Sun City record against everybody's, uh, you know, it was only the four of us, me and, and Danny Schechter and Arthur Baker and, and Hart Perry, who uh, really believed in this new thing called rap and how important it was. The rest of the industry was hoping it would go away. I mean, they literally, they couldn't believe, you know, you're putting Melly Mel next to Miles Davis and, and David Ruffin and, you know, and Jackson Brown. You know, I'm like, yeah, that's how important I think that these guys are. It was just a moment there before it really blossomed into the success that it would soon become. But hip hop was just a runaway sort of rebel hybrid in the beginning. And then it would become a very valuable, you know, hybrid of the rock era. You talk about in the book, the importance of hard work for artists like the Beatles doing their time in Hamburg and the clubs of Liverpool. And as you read about the journey of the E Street Band, it's hard to do it from 2021 without understanding how it's going to work out, that it almost seems like your success was self-evident and preordained, you know, back then. But you guys really grinded it out, right? I mean, you spent years in the clubs. Yeah. No success is inevitable. (laughs) I mean, that that is a fact, man. I know it looks like that, you know. That's why I fought so hard to get the... In retrospect, it does. It's like, well, of course, they're the E Street Band. It's Springsteen, I mean, right? Exactly. But it was the same way with the four most important artists of the rock era. This is why I fought so hard to get their managers into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, because without those managers, their success was not inevitable either. And I'm talking about Elvis Presley, Bob Dylan, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, all four of which were laughed at, passed on by every company, you name it. They were not in any way born successful. Nobody is. The main job of a manager is advocacy. You need an advocate. And this is the one thing, you know, that my problem most of my life I never had, you know, and I really felt it. Content's only half the story, man. You you can create all the content you want, but the other half of the story is marketing. You got to sell it, let people know about it, know that it exists. And those four artists, man, had four amazing advocates. And now I only succeeded in getting two into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for various reasons that were, I, I disagreed with completely. But Colonel Tom Parker and Albert Grossman, Brian Epstein and, and Andrew Lugoldum, I couldn't get the Colonel or uh, Albert Grossman in because they were two controversial people felt. So I just completely disagree with because um, it's what they accomplished. It's not who they were. I don't care who they were. It's what they accomplished. And what they accomplished was history making and extraordinarily important. Would Elvis Presley, Bob Dylan, the Beatles and Rolling Stones have made it anyway? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. And I know that sounds, you know, oh, they would certainly would have made it. You know, they're so good. I know five better guitar players in Asbury Park than me and Bruce. Okay, (laughs) you know, (laughs) right now, (laughs) okay, there's five better guys in Asbury Park than me and Bruce, all right? You know, do I know their names? (laughs) You probably would, yes. The point is, there's a lot of talented people in the world. The difference between somebody making it and sometimes not making it is often the the manager, you know, so it's an important part of the puzzle, you know. You might be gratified or horrified to find out that our dog's name is Colonel Tom Parker. (laughs) <laughs> my son's name is Elvis. So, you know, there's a theme there. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So tell me about those years of grinding it out. Did you feel like it was a slog or was it just so much fun that you guys were ready to play every single night? Well, you managed to have some fun in between the sets <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and after the night. Five sets a night is a long work day, man. It is. Only the Beatles that did more. They, they were doing six sets. It was kind of a a mixed thing. You're not 100% appreciating what you're doing. You're not completely having nothing but fun. You are, in some ways, kind of struggling to make it in your own way and to um, improve your craft and to see where you're going. Because 
look, we could have stayed at the bar band in Asbury Park and tell you the truth. <laughs> I never made so much sense, you know? I mean, considering my overhead, you know? <laughs> I mean, that was the richest I'll ever be. You could have done that forever, maybe, but something inside you wanted more than that. We were completely reinventing the definition of a bar band by adding horns and a combination of rock and soul that I returned to for these previous three years, you know, before the quarantine with soul fire and summer of sorcery, I returned to that sound, which is the identity that was most uniquely me, you know, oops, there goes my wife's phone. Uh (laughs) It happens. Uh, It happens. It was most uniquely that particular combination was most uniquely me. And so we didn't know we were making history at the time. We ended up influencing a lot of the whole bar band scene with the jukes. You're just kind of getting by, you know, and having as much fun as you can have. It's just sort of a lifestyle at that point. But you're looking you're looking for more, you know. So as long as you have that ambition looking for more, you're never quite settled where you are. You guys finally break through in a big way, if I have this right, on the Born to Run tour with the sold out shows at the bottom line. And then you go to L.A. and play the Roxy. And you say you glanced up midway through the first song and saw Warren Beatty, Jack Nicholson, Jackie DeShannon, David Geffen, and Cher. I didn't look up again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was shocking in, in those days. You know what I mean? Like that, that was a that was a big deal, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're, 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 you know, you come from Asbury Park. You don't you don't see celebrities every day. You know, you don't see them on the boardwalk. And I, you know, I've never seen that many celebrities in one place <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and they're looking at you going, who are these guys? How'd that feel? Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize how unique we were until the article started to come out. This one, uh, I remember this one writer thinking that we, we had to be from central casting. We, we had to be invented by somebody right. because we, <laughs> we were just... We were just too, we were just a, a normal, natural New Jersey bar band, but that was quite exotic in LA. <laughs> you know, <That> was, <laughs> I didn't really know why, uh, you know, I mean, we weren't really doing anything particularly different than anybody else. Uh, exactly. Just opening with a 60s song was mind blowing <laughs> for some reason in 1975. The song was I forget which one it was, but it was like, you know, only 10 years earlier. You know, it wasn't like it was 50 years earlier. It's just 10 years earlier. But that was a radical statement of opening with a 60s song. Because everybody was just so uh, looking forward and the glam thing uh, was happening and and disco and punk was about to happen and uh, and hip hop was about to happen and all of these new new sort of uh, progressive evolutions of the art form were taking place. And we were really kind of a throwback just from having a saxophone in a band was already uh, quite a statement. We wore that tradition on our sleeve. We weren't trying to hide it. We were making a statement that we're carrying on this tradition that has existed, go back as far as you want to go back and trace it back to Sun House or wherever you want to trace it back to Louis Armstrong and we're moving it forward. We're not into nostalgia, but we are recognizing that tradition is going to be part of our work. We're going to take that tradition and turn it into a new, a new hybrid, a new type of artistic hybrid that, that will be modern and new, but you will be able to hear the roots in it. And that's okay. That's okay. What that journalist saw, though, was a band that had been in the making for whatever, a decade, forging friendship and chemistry for all those years. And so she doesn't see what goes into that flow on stage. Well, that's right. I mean, by then, I mean, me and Bruce have been friends for 10 years by then. So that friendship thing, we bought it literally. We we bought the British invasion thing literally. You know, we didn't know they all hated each other. You know, we we thought they were all best friends. You know, you know, Nick and Keith are just the best of friends, right? Well, yeah, and the, and the Davies brothers, Sean and Paul, and Pete and Roger, and we thought they just were all the best of friends. I mean, if you see the movie Help, the second Beatles movie, which is you know one of my favorite movies. 
The four of them go up to this uh, row of flats of apartments and they all go into a, a different door and then they go through the door and it's all one big room. <laughs> you know, they're, all, <laughs> they're all living in one, one place. And that's how you, you know, uh, that's how psychologically that's what you thought was happening. You know, you thought they were just all best friends and, and we bought that illusion. And of course it was true at one point. Only with us, it was real and stayed real to this day. I mean, still one of my best friends. And and you sense that on stage when we go on stage because we're having fun together. I'm enjoying the show as much as anybody when we go on stage. And, uh, and you know, me and him have a thing. We have a little bit of a some shtick that we do uh, that just has come from being friends so long. We don't, you know, practice anything or, or rehearse it or write it. But we just, you know, whatever happens on stage, you know, we just kind of, we know our our roles are uh, uh, have come quite organically through the years. So so it was the same thing back then. We just weren't nameless, faceless side men. You know, we were somebody into somebodies, but the somebodies it was really a band. It wasn't a front man with a bunch of hired session guys. It was a band. I refer to us as the Rock and Roll Rat Pack. Me as Dino and and, and Clarence as Sammy on steroids. But we basically had that communication for people, and they and they enjoyed that immediately and, and sensed that. I, I think, and that was, uh, I guess, unusual even then to be communicating that kind of interaction. You know, authentic friendship on stage. Yeah, which it was for real. But you're also in business with your friends. And so when it came time for you to do your own thing a few years later, right as the band is about to hit real commercial success, and for all the lay people in the audience, you think that Born to Run is going to make everybody in the band rich, but the real money starts happening, what, early, mid-80s, right, with Born in the USA? Uh, Well, The River was successful. The the fifth album, The River, was successful. Born to Run certainly did make some noise, as you suggested, uh, but it wasn't a big success. It wasn't actually a hit. Darkness, the fourth album, uh, had all kinds of problems with radio and et cetera. So it was not until the fifth album that we really achieved some success with The River. At that point, we had our first hit single, Hungry Heart, and that sold out arenas for us nationwide. So at that, at that point, you're a success. You know, you're, you're selling out arenas. You have a hit single. You don't need anything more than that. Born in the USA, of course, was a lot more than that, but it wasn't necessary. We had achieved the miraculous success we had dreamed of by the river. And you decided to go your own way, to quote Fleetwood Mac. Did Bruce understand yes. your, your thinking? No. <laughs> he says succinctly. It was not a uh, well-received moment. Everybody tried to talk me out of it, everybody. Now, of course, you know, half of me wishes I'd listened. But whatever, destiny had something else in mind. So I left under, it was awkward for, for a minute, uh, but we recovered quite quickly. Within months, we sat down and, and you know, uh, he played me uh, the final couple of songs for Born in the USA, which I had not participated in. I had not produced specifically by being there. And I played him my... Uh, Voice of America album. At that point, of course, I didn't. I didn't know he was going to call the album "Born in the USA." I didn't know that he was going to have uh, flags and red, white, and blue everywhere, just like my album did. Mine was just released, I think, a couple of months before his. And the minute his came out, you know, my my Voice of America became a very, <laughs> a very silent. <laughs> it was a silenced voice. <laughs> you just needed Courtney Cox in a video. That's all you needed. Yeah, yeah. I wish I thought of that. Yeah, but uh, you know. When did you first get interested in the anti-apartheid movement? I had this need to learn about what we're doing. On the river tour in Germany, it was our first, really our first big European tour. We had done a few shows with the Born to Run record, but um, this was a real tour. And the kid in Germany asked me why I'm putting missiles in his country. And um, I, of course, didn't understand that question. I then thought about it and realized that, oh, my God, I'm an American. You know, I never thought about that. And what does that mean? You know, what are, what are the responsibilities that go with being an American? What, uh, what does this mean? So I started reading about our uh, foreign policy since World War II, 
and was really shocked to find we were not the heroes of democracy everywhere and not supporting, you know, the right sides of a lot of the wars. And, uh, and uh, I became obsessed with it and decided that I would write about it. And that would be my identity. I was coming from that 60s sensibility of that Renaissance consciousness when you really had to have a justification for your existence. I mean, you really did have to have an identity that was unique. So I thought, well, I'll be the political guy. There are people always showing up and doing important things in protests, various uh, concerts that, that have to do with issues, but nobody was doing it full time. I said, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do, I'll do it full time. I wrote down uh, all the conflicts that we were involved in. There was like 40 or so. And one of them was South Africa. I couldn't find out much about South Africa. You know, usually I, I could research almost anything. Now, keep in mind, there's no internet back then, which is, would have been a big help. Was it in the World Book Encyclopedia back then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you had to kind of find, find books about whatever subject you were into. And for some reason, South Africa was a bit of a mystery. You know, there was rumors that they were fixing this very bad government and doing reforms. And so I ended up going down there to, to do the research. And I went down twice in 84 and found that the, the reforms they were doing were all phony and uh, decided this government's got to come down. They're, they're really, really bad. I took the song off of my third album and I was going to have one artist from every genre join me, five or six but it ended up with about 50 artists. and uh, This song was Sun City, right? Yeah. Sun City was a, a resort in South Africa that they were pretending was in a different country. In order to establish the cultural boycott, we said, you know, we're not going to play Sun City. We're not going to go down and perform. And uh, it was extremely successful at the time and led to uh, the downfall of the government and led to Mandela being released. So it was a very, very rare, complete victory because I was involved in various political issues all through the 80s. You know, you win a few, you lose a few, you gain an inch here, an inch there. You know, this was a complete victory, which was really unusual. I said earlier that your activities covered a breadth of topics, not meaning you didn't go deep on many of them, including the South Africa issue. You really put your butt on the line, including the opening salvo in your memoir where you're under a coat in the backseat of a car being smuggled through certain lines in South Africa. I wanted the book to read like a detective novel or like a, you know, like a Dan Brown, you know, book, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you don't know what's coming next. Yeah. Because in my life, I, I didn't know what was coming next. I wanted it to kind of feel like my life has felt, which was just weird road wherever it kind of took me at any given time. I wanted to, you know, share the, share what I was observing and share what I was learning. I didn't want to write it to talk about my own narrative. I mean, that's the least interesting part of the book to me. It's what I saw along the way. It's what I did along the way. That's the interesting part. Little things about the crafts that I throw in and, a little bit of history I throw in. That's the stuff I think that's most interesting because I was just like a vehicle for these things happening, you know, as I travel through life. And, you know, I was hoping it would be more of a, more of a page turner type of book for those who are not necessarily interested in music or rock and roll. And I wanted it to be a bit more universal than that. So speaking of things you didn't see coming, when did David Chase, the creator of The Sopranos, come on the scene for you? Just walking my dog in the 90s, and uh, David Chase gets me on the phone and says, you know, I'm doing a new TV show. You know, do you want to be in it? You know, and I was like, geez, thank you. It's such, such a nice compliment. But no, no thanks. Uh, I'm not an actor. And he was like, yeah, you are an, you're an actor. You just don't know it yet. So come on down. And I, frankly, had nothing better to do because at that point I had no record deal or anything. So I went down there and, um, you know, started a whole new craft. It was, you know, it was just handed to me. Quite a gift, quite a gift to be given a whole new craft like that to learn. I did the best I could. You know, my wife was really the actor in the family. So I'd learned some things from watching her. She was doing acting class every day and we talk about it. So, you know, I picked up some things from her and, um, and then I had to, I had to decide my own, my own philosophy because I had, I had to figure something out. I decided that every characteristic 
known to humankind exists in all of us. And the acting craft is finding the appropriate pieces of that particular character and bringing it to life, you know, inhabiting, inhabiting those characteristics. And so I felt if I could look in the mirror and see the guy, I could, I could be that guy, you know? And so I, I had to work from the outside in and I uh, wrote a whole biography about the guy. He was kind of, a, uh, he was a bit of a throwback, a bit of a romantic thinking that, you know, the old days were better. The good old mob days are over. Everybody's ratting everybody out these days. And there's no, there's no honor anymore. There's no dignity, you know, in being a, a mafiosi, you know. Uh, I had his hair be more 50s. And uh, it ended up fulfilling an important role because it's, at some point I said to David, you know, I, I, I really kind of feel guilty taking an actor's job. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what, then I'll write you in a part. So I was like, all right, well, you know, he ended up running a strip club for the family. But somewhere in that first season, you know, kind of ended up becoming the underboss and the consigliere, which uh, it didn't exactly start off that way. You know, it wasn't really written that way. It wasn't written at all. <laughs> and it ended up be- becoming a, a sort of an important role in the family, uh, which uh, David picked up on right away. The other writers, too. But... Uh, I think David recognized, you know, my relationship with Bruce Springsteen could actually be quite useful here. And that's what we ended up doing, basically, because I I knew what those dynamics were. You were the right-hand guy who the boss trusted. Yeah, and the only guy that doesn't want to be the boss. The guy that's looking out for him, looking, looking, watching his back. The guy that has to bring the bad news occasionally, because you're the only guy that doesn't fear him. So you can handle the reaction when you bring the bad news. Right. <laughs> and one of my favorite scenes in Sopranos is one of those scenes where, you know, you bring the bad news and the boss goes crazy on you. It turned out to be um, a real natural, organic type of relationship that I knew I knew all about. You know, slightly different setting, a little bit more at stake, you know, yeah. like life, life and death. Life and death. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. That was a surprise. So then stepping into the role of boss for Lilyhammer, where it was really all on, excuse me, I don't mean to say it's all on you, but a lot of it was on you to be the star, to get the thing produced, to sell it to Netflix. I mean, you took on a lot of responsibility for that project. How was that energy? Well, you know, you want to, when, when people have faith in you, you want to deliver. I get very, very, uh, it's so unusual. When somebody actually is doing something good for you or, or <laughs> believing in you or, you know, it's it's extremely rare, you know. And when that happens, uh, I want to, like, over-deliver. So, first of all, the husband and wife that wrote the thing for me, you want to over-deliver for them. You want it to be a, a big success. We sold it to Netflix with their first show. And Ted Sarandos had the incredible courage of having a first show with subtitles. What a crazy move that is, right? Right. I want to over-deliver for him. We did, you know? I mean, we ended up selling that thing to 130 countries. And the first Netflix show, I, I still think it's the best <laughs> Netflix show. <laughs> but I'm a little bit prejudiced about that. Of course. But it was, it was something I'm very, very, very proud of because we ended up having to satisfy the Netflix subscription cable audience, which, you know... Is all about adult entertainment. Let's face it, violence and sex and language and complexity and you name it. And the Norwegian network was a family, a family friendly network. <laughs> uh, we were the most outrageous show ever on Norwegian TV. You know, they put it on late, like 10 o'clock at night or something. But um, we managed to walk that line for three seasons, 24 shows. And, uh, Make both audiences happy, which, you know, I, I, <laughs> I sometimes uh, marvel at myself. I'm like, I don't know how we quite did that. We won local awards in Norway and we won best show of the year twice in Monte Carlo. So we were making everybody happy somehow. And they were just genius writers. I helped them shape it a little bit. You know, I'm very, very proud of that, of that show. I, I'd do it again tomorrow if they wanted to. Last question, so we're going to let you go here. When you think back on all the things that you've accomplished in your life and your career, what are you most proud of? Well, I think the things that 
that are going to last will be the teachrock.org, the music history curriculum that we've created. Uh, I think that'll last. It's already got like 40,000 teachers registered and partner schools all over the place starting to teach it. I think the integration of arts into the education process is an essential one. And I think we're really emphasizing that and kind of turning people on to that idea that you can have an artistic sensibility in every discipline and it changes the way kids learn. I think so. I think that's an important thing that's going to go beyond me. I think my two radio formats will live beyond me. Sirius Satellite, both the Underground Garage rock format and the Outlaw Country format. I think I guess the most important thing I've done in my life will be, you know, bringing down the South African government, getting Mandela out of jail when we did. I don't think I'll be, I probably won't be remembered for that or anything, but that's fine. But but I think that's probably the most important thing I've done in my life in terms of, uh, you know, an impact. Would the South African government have fallen eventually? Probably, yes. But we took years off of it, at least. You know, when people are dying every day and, if two or three or four or five years later, would Mandela have been as coherent and, and together as he was when he came out? And what a difference that would have made if, God forbid, if Mandela had died in, in prison. When the South African government fell, it would have been an enormous bloodbath. So, you know, I think, I think those, those things are things I'm proud of. Well, CB, I really appreciate your time. I enjoyed reading the book. It's called Unrequited Infatuations. It's out on September 28th. You can pre-order now on Amazon. Where can our listeners find out more about you if they want to hear what you're thinking every day? Yeah, I think it's littlesteven.com. I think everything is there. All right. We'll put links to it in the show notes. Thanks again for your time. It was a blast. Absolutely. Good talking to you. All right, super groovy to talk to Stevie Van Zant. If you dig rock and roll memoirs, you'll enjoy this one. See the link to his website in the show notes. You can uh, click there and start the purchase process for the book. It's not like you have to apply for a loan or anything, at least I hope not. And if you do, you probably shouldn't be listening to this podcast. You should be out working. Anyway, let's get to takeaways. I found it really interesting to talk to Stevie, somebody who, objectively speaking, somebody from the outside, you know, we would say, well, that guy is famous. That guy's not only famous, but he's got character. He's, he's a unique human being, and he's done a lot of incredibly interesting things. That guy's got to be successful. He's got to feel great about what he's accomplished. I don't know. Did he sound super jazzed about every part of his career? No. There are a lot of things that he did that I think he was disappointed in. Thus, the title of the book, Unrequited Infatuations. And when you read the book, you'll see that, or if you ever listen to his interviews, you'll hear he had all these different projects, all these things that his, that his heart took him to. And a lot of those infatuations didn't pan out the way he had planned or had hoped. And so it's interesting that do we have to be commercially successful to feel successful about who we are? It's hard to turn that instinct off, you know, objectively speaking, I'm pretty successful, but every morning I wake up and my brain is like, come on, we got to go prove ourselves. We got to go achieve more. We got to book better guests. We got to sell that book to some publisher. We got to hit the New York Times bestseller list. We got to do all these things. And how much worse would it be if my best friend was one of the most famous musicians on the planet? And when he walked on stage, people said, brew. Anyway, it would be hard. All right. Number two, when you choose one path, you don't get to find out what would have happened if you had stayed on the other one. Just like Stevie left the E Street Band for 17 years to go focus on his own side projects, he won't know what would have happened financially, professionally, if he'd stayed on that path. I often have doubts. Should I have left Facebook when I left? I don't know. I left a lot of money on the table. What would life have looked like if I had given that path my all instead of this path? I don't know, but I feel pretty good about this one. I feel like I'm living in line with who I want to be, and I just have to take what I know to be true about that path as opposed to worrying about what may or may not have happened on the other path. Last takeaway, I love what Stevie said about why he worked so hard on Lily Hammer. He said, when people have faith in you, you want to deliver. So for all the people who believe in you, you're going to double down and work hard, not for your own reward, but to pay back karmically other people's belief in you. And so I want to say thank you to the people who have believed in me artistically this year. Ed Rowland, Charlie Brusco, Taylor Cottrell, John Willig, my wife Stacy, all the clubs who booked me to perform, and all of you who listen to this show, I really appreciate your faith in me and I want to deliver. Trust me, I work hard to make sure that I do, and I'm going to do that again tomorrow. Speaking of creating good stuff, I've got a great conversation next week to share with you with J.R. Martinez. 
He is a dad and a husband. He's also the survivor of a horrific injury in Iraq where he was a soldier back in 2003. He suffered third degree burns over 34% of his body and had 34 surgeries over like two and a half years to recover. He then went on to star on All My Children and Dancing with the Stars. You've probably seen him before on Oprah, 60 Minutes or Ellen. He and I just had a great conversation. He was sitting in, in line at his daughter's school waiting to pick her up for carpool. And we talked about being dads. We talked about how life works out. And it was a really cool chat. I look forward to sharing with you that week. Until then, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.